Um, our speaker today is Professor uh, Richard Joseph, um, who is Professor Emeritus of Political Science from Northwestern. Uh, he has been a professor in several different places, including Emory University, Dartmouth College, and the University of California at Los Angeles, as well as the University of Ibadan in Nigeria and the University of Khartoum in Sudan. Um, he has held uh, as well as he's held uh, fellowships at Harvard University, Boston University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, I mean, it goes on and on, Richard. Uh, <laughs> Mickelson Institute and the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in France. Um, his scholarly career has been devoted to the study of governance in Africa, and especially uh, those aspects of governance related to democracy. Very interestingly, uh, Professor Joseph uh, served at the Carter Center, where he worked on several different, uh, please come in if you would like, um, where he served on several uh, different missions, including uh, an historic mission to Zambia um, during one of the first um, democratic transitions uh, in Africa. Uh, so something of great common interest to us. Um, he's been a longtime member of the Council on Foreign Relations and has had numerous other fellowships, including something called the Rhodes Scholarship, the Kent Fellowship, the Guggenheim Fellowship. And from 2002 to 2003, he held a visiting fellowship at the U.S. Institute of Peace and the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, just in case there's anything left out, he has also been a Fulbright. So I think we've run out of all the prestigious fellowships we could come up with. Um, Professor Joseph's career has also included a whole series of important books, um, just a few of them here, Radical Nationalism in Cameroon, Dallas Africa, Cameroon under Amadou uh, Ahijo, Democracy and Pre-Bendel pre Politics in Nigeria. That forced me to go to Google <laughs> search to find out what that meant. I, I urge you all to look it up. Um, State Conflict and Democracy in Africa, and Africa Demos series. So that is an incredible uh, list of scholarly achievements. I'm especially interested in uh, pre-Bendel politics in Nigeria because it no doubt bears on today's topic. The devices, is everything all set up? <laughs> yes. All right, wonderful. All right, so uh, it's a profound pleasure to be back here. Um, um, I would like to say that this is very familiar. <laughs> But anyway, um, but thank you very much, uh, you know, um, for um, you know Ambassador Cirella, for Eric, you know, um, for Scott Taylor, for Tim Longman, right, um, and all of you that you know, some like Tim Weister, I've known going back a long time, and of course, you know, being able to have my granddaughter actually uh, be present, and she promises to. Uh, to be to be back tomorrow for the luncheon, so uh, along with some others. All right, so um, this is really one in a series of events uh, that are taking place uh, concerning uh, Nigeria's 2023 elections. Um, and you know, just giving you advance word in about ten weeks. Um, if all comes together, we should be having an event uh, uh, in Oxford. I was just talking to Tim Weiskill, we were there, um, and it also is going to be again um, on the elections. Uh, and by that time, you know, you know, if it's, it takes place on June 19th, it means Nigeria might have transitioned. I think might, but no one quite knows, uh, you know, what is going to happen uh, between now and the supposed date of the inauguration on May 29th. <clears throat> um, this event, it's a Boston University event. Um, it's an American event because we are uh, online through Zoom. It's also global. Uh, but it's also a Nigeria event. <laughs> uh, and so in Nigeria events, on Nigeria events speaking, there usually would be an invocation Anybody familiar with Nigeria will know there'll be an invocation. Um, usually there'll be a Christian invocation, and then there'll be an Islamic invocation. 
and they can't cover all the the traditional beliefs, right? Um, so um, after the what I call the contentious elections on February 25th, uh, I've been in touch with many colleagues, and to one of them I said, "Well, you know, we have you know our prayers for the next round of the election," and I got a response saying to me that um, they didn't need my prayers. Uh, what they needed uh, was more than that in terms of the country was facing. Uh, but it turns out that um, uh, a poem by Mary Oliver was shared with me, and I'm going to read it for you. So that is going to take the place of the invocation. Uh, and it's the title is Praying, and I'll read it. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. Iris is a flower, because there are people online who might not know that. It could be weeds in a vacant lot, or a few small stones. Just pay attention, then patch. A few words together, and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. And in Nigeria right now, there is, and here is the great uh, Darren Q, who has, uh, has arrived. Uh, I know all will be well. Uh, but Nigeria is, in fact, my subtitle for today's event is Nigeria Between Hope and Dread. Uh, I don't want it to sound too Careful, but those of us who've been involved with Nigeria for a while, we have seen this before, and we hope it ends well this time. The prospects for political renewal and stability vary widely among analysts. For a somewhat critical view, I recommend a recorded program on March 24th entitled Nigeria Elections, Its Meaning for the Country, Its People, and the World, organized by the Royal African Society, Africa Society um, and it took place in London, hosted by the School of Oriental and African Studies, March 24th, and it's recorded. For persons wanting to have their hopes lifted, I recommend Professor Ken Opalo's March 16 Substack essay entitled On Why I Remain Bullish on Nigeria. His first paragraph, though, he mentions his cautious optimism. So I'm afraid we went very quickly from being bullish to being cautiously optimistic. His cautious optimism is based on identifying the shortcomings and even failures of Nigeria and setting them against its potentialities, especially economic. The scales appear to tip for Opalu in favor of the latter, namely the potentialities over the shortcomings. Nigeria has always had contrasting attributes. The scales in practice, however, have usually shifted towards what Alex de Waal has called development in reverse. And the question is, will it be different this time? Here are different scenarios that I have received from Nigerian colleagues. The first one I call the Bola Tinubu promise, connected to his party, the All Progressives, Progressives Congress. And we see that in the quick declaration of INEC, right, the Independent National Electoral Commission, declaring Tinubu's victory, followed by a quick congratulation from the United States government. Now, what were the reasons for that? This quickness. 
perhaps the eight desultory years of the Buhari administration. Nigeria, and I'm simply being descriptive here, has seen decline in three sectors, security, economy, and poverty, conflict, unemployment, indebtedness, its regional, continental, and global stature, on and on and on, it's quite a list. Now I heard from colleague, and I'll call him colleague A, who told me that a Tinubu-led APC government was Nigeria's best hope for improvements in infrastructure, security, and economic development. And the reason he gave was Tinubu's achievements as Lagos State Governor between 1999 and 2007, and which continued under his successor, Baba Tunde Fashola. 2007 to 2015. And that Tinubu's promise was also captured by the phrase a government of competence. Then we have the Peter Obi promise, the candidate of the Labour Party. The notable supporters, among others, have been Nigeria's youth and also former president Olushegun Obasanjo came out very early and strong for Obi. I heard from colleague, I'll call him colleague B, not a youth. For colleague B, Obi represented the best hope among presidential contenders for transformative governance and by which he described as non-prebendal, that word you had to look up, and developmental. Obi also symbolizes the incorporation of the Southeast, namely the Igbos, among contenders for the all-important position of executive president in post-Civil War Nigeria and other ways. All right. Colleague C. And the colleague C, that scenario includes muddled elections and Nigeria muddling through. Now I can provide the name for this scenario, and he should be online. And his name is Professor Rutimi Subaru of Bennington College. He published an article on the 2007 elections in the Journal of Democracy entitled Nigeria's Muddled Elections. Now, there's an op-ed I've shared with a number of persons, and it's available. It appeared in the Chicago Tribune online on March 15th, and then in print on March 16th. And it echoes what Saburu wrote indeed about the April 2007 election, right? So if you could recall some of the commentaries on the recent elections, and here's what Subaru had to say about 2007, and I know for him, I know Scott loves this phrase, Fou que je change, Fou c'est la même chose, all right? And he wrote, what should have been a milestone for democracy threatens instead to become a millstone as an electoral process riddled with corruption and malfeasance raises doubts about prospects for democratic stability and consolidation. Subaru wrote me following the March 18th state level elections that Nigeria seems to have muddled through. I told him, I think I agreed with that provisional assessment, but you know, it still continues, it ain't over yet. Asiwaju Bola Tinubu, or as he's more often referred to now as Bola Ahmed Tinubu, that insertion of his or use of Ahmed is important. It tells you something about political strategizing. Is the president elect? That is, unless the election tribunal of the Supreme Court 
rules otherwise in a speeded up process. And I'll skip over the whole process of challenging elections in Nigeria, the outcomes at different levels, but there's a lot of uncertainty. Now, I will talk about beyond muddling through, and this is going to be a lot of my focus here. And in 10 weeks, if we pull things together in Oxford, and that's also is going to be webcast, uh, and I think yes, in that conversation. My focus personally is on Nigeria at 65. Right. Uh, another four years, I'm hopeful, but I could, you know, October 1st, 2025, when Nigeria will be 65. Nigeria, Africa, and of course the world needs stability. Professor Toyen Falola, you all will know from the University uh, of Texas in, in Houston, remarked after the February 25th voting that the violence wasn't excessive. It did increase on March 18th, but was much less than in prior national elections. Indeed, an essay that I wrote on the 2011 election is entitled, and it's available online, I entitled it Beyond Voting and Rioting, just to give you a sense of how much Nigeria's elections have been contentious and indeed fraught. Uh, I'm going to skip over a lot of the issues about uh, conflict, insecurity that will be known to many of you and it's a backdrop to a lot of what's taking place. I also exchanged messages with Professor Atahiru Jega, who brought a high level of probity, courage, and competence to INEC, and who in fact stepped up significantly the use um, of technology to combat fraud. Now, we have asked a few experts on Nigerian elections and politics to add their insights at the start of the question and answer today. I am intrigued by Professor Darren Hughes' contention, and Darren and I have exchanged messages, that opposition gains in the National Assembly could lead to a check on an imperial presidency and also an enhanced role for the federal legislature. Darren also surmised that Peter Obi could parlay his new stature and political support into a continuing role in national politics. We await Darren's input, input today. I'm also going to hold back on the critical role about Nigeria's re-emergence on the regional, continental, and global scene especially during a period of such conflict on the continent uh, that is sometimes referred to as great power conflicts. And Nigeria has been pretty much been absent when you consider the role it has played in the past. The question is, can the 2023 elections serve as a gateway Mary Oliver talks about a door that have a similar thing in mind. Uh, Scott Taylor um, hosted me for a talk I gave not too long ago at Georgetown on the impacts on issues of state and governance. Right? Will we able to see an exit from that impact? I have also referred in an exit, in an essay, to the dismal tunnel in Nigeria along a number of fronts. Will we see an exit from that? <clears throat> Professor Ayo Olukotun, and I want to give him a shout out here. Um, I'm giving his memory a shout out. This is somebody who is very important for those of us who follow Nigeria affairs. He passed on January 4th of this year. And you can go online and you can see him speaking and he was not expressing great optimism about the elections and its 
the likelihood this will lead the country out of the dilemmas it has been in. I'll also mention Wole Shuinka, who's been so important on so many issues over the years. And not too long ago, Professor Shuinka said that he thinks he was going to go silent about Nigeria because he called it derailed. It no longer reflected, he said, his core beliefs and his values. I look forward to hearing from some of the other the people we have on, on queue here. One of them is Amata Anku of the Eurasia Group, and she was in Nigeria for the election. So let me conclude my brief remarks. I started off by saying Nigeria between hope and dread. Um, my concern, because there is a lot of deep rumblings in Nigeria behind the actual election, and I'll just mention a couple of those concerns. The first one is, and Darren and others would be aware of this, that young Nigerians um, often tend to refer to Nigeria as Niger. And we use that term Niger as a more positive version uh, for the entity that exists. It's also use of the term Biafra. Biafra has resurfaced. Indeed, uh, someone uh, was asked, where are you from? Not too long, and that person referred Biafra. Right? And what has been going on in the Southeast for some time. I have a concern about the ways in which an alternative notion for Nigeria of Niger and this term, what we thought from the distant past, Biafra, uh, seem to be converging. Don't know. My other concern, and I'll end it here, because um, I was reading an article about a conviction that took place um, in the U.S. of someone who was involved with the U.S. 2016 election and where the involvement um, online was convicted as um, electoral misconduct that was in fact aimed at suppressing the vote of certain communities. And my concern about electoral malfeasance, misconduct, and we're so used to all of these elements of misconduct, at what point do they become a real attack on actual voting rights in Nigeria. Okay, so I will stop here. Those are my introductory remarks. Um, and with some, I hope that uh, some of the other commentators can give us a little more uplift that I'm able to deliver to you on this particular moment. So over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Joseph, you put a lot on the table and introduced a lot of people's ideas and given them the opportunity to expand and expound themselves. Uh, so I hope that we really have a conversation today about these very important elections and the future of democracy in Nigeria. Um, shall we begin with um, Professor uh, Darren Q, if you'd like, since you're here in the room? Sure. I'm calling on you, which is not really fair, but, um, but I think uh, Professor Joseph suggested we want to make some comments. Can you just stay here? Or? Yes, the, this thing should follow you, although I wonder if they'll be able to see you. If you want, you can come right up to the. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I mean, uh, congratulations to Richard and thank you for the, the kind shout out as well. Um, I was a, uh, an observer in Nigeria with NDI this time for the election, so a lot of my comments are, are based on, I think, that experience as well. Um, maybe four quick points just to add to what Richard said. I, I would focus first and foremost, I think, on the technology dimension of this election, uh, which I think is really important and, and interesting. The, 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 um, uh, the iPad, essentially, that they were using to capture 
both the accreditation data and to transfer the results directly to the INEX Central called DBAS is sort of the, the central issue in so many ways in, in this election. Uh, first of all, it's failure to deliver um, the, the promised um, transmission of the results directly from the polling units to INEX Central. But even more so, I would, I would point to what was happening before that in the sense that I think that technology raised a lot of expectations about this election. And that combined with what, with what Richard was talking about in terms of the Peter Obi factor, I think had raised expectations that this election was going to be much, much better than it, than it was in the past. And so we're not only dealing with the problems that, that DBAS created, but also the dashed hopes that these very high expectations had, I think, going into this election, particularly in terms of uh, the Peter Obi's supporters, um, who, uh, if you actually, I think, look at this in particular, had already been, um, to some extent, disenfranchised during the, the uh, voter accreditation period. Um, if you look at the, the numbers of people that picked up the voting cards prior to even the election happening, uh, the folks who had the most difficulty in actually getting those voting cards were the newer, younger voters. And these were likely to be heavily uh, going in, in the OB uh, direction. And a lot of the opinion polling that we saw, some of which was very good prior to the election, was showing a very strong uh, OB showing that OB was likely to be the 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 victor in the first round. I don't think anyone was going to get a, a victory in the first round. This was likely to go to a second round. But the expectation very much was that Obi was going to come out the victor. And when he comes out third in the actual polling, um, this this is uh, leads to, I think, a lot of the dashing of, of these expectations and increasing the frustration that we're seeing at the moment. So I think that sort of the, the BVAS being a very important piece of this. So I would I would say that that that, that that situation is not done. We still have INEC claiming that 94% of that data from the presidential election is now on the website. And the political parties and you know a number of private NGOs and other actors are sifting through this data as we speak. So we still have to, we still may find out that, uh, that the, the BVAS data actually showed a very different picture than the actual you know, hand correlated data that, that INEC actually you know, declared, which they're supposed to do under the law, that the, you know, the victor gets declared based on, on the hand correlated data. But the law also says that when there's a doubt, the BVAS data wins the day. So this leads to the big question of, will the courts actually act upon this data? The courts, particularly the Supreme Court in the past, has had a, has a tendency to, uh, to rule on some technicality in order to avoid actually looking at the evidence of the case. The big question is whether they will do that again this time around. I think all the likelihood is that they will. Um, however, the Supreme Court could, could throw a curve into this. They have made controversial decisions in the past. They have taken on the executive in the past. They have never overturned a presidential election. I would not bet on it this time around, but I wouldn't say the chances are zero. And depending upon how this mulling through of the actual data looks, if the evidence actually shows that you know, there are some significant changes um, between what, we, what the official totals are and what the polling unit totals were. This could be a far more interesting couple of months that we're, and we're facing that, that, could, you know, that could perhaps change. And if the Supreme Court actually shows some guts on this um, and actually you know, bows to the will of the public, and the public will will be based upon how this numbers, uh, these numbers change, we still have possibly some interesting weeks ahead. I would say that the likelihood is no, is that you know, we're likely to see Tanubu getting sworn in and that the, the Supreme Court is not going to take on a standing president. But you know, there's a possibility there. Um, second, I think Richard has mentioned already um, uh, the, the possibilities for political opposition here. And um, this is something I think you know, we've seen across Africa uh, and definitely in, in Nigeria's case is when you see a viable political opposition, you tend to get better elections because the, the viable opposition is the only internal actor that has an interest in clean elections. The elections that put Buhari into office in 2015 in Nigeria were, were perhaps the most balanced between the APC and the PDP. And this election as well, we see the opposition and the APC were fairly balanced in terms of powers on the ground. 
And had the opposition united with one candidate, we would have had a very different outcome in this election. If you put together the vote totals for the three opposition candidates and had the three of them come together, we would have had one of them uh, as the victor right now in this election, but instead they haven't. And as, and as Richard noted, I'm, I'm watching very closely to see whether the House totals, the APC currently has the majority in the Senate, but the House is still undecided and the APC does not have the majority there yet. Um, is it, it, it raises a, a tantalizing possibility of some kind of a rainbow coalition in the House among the opposition. That would again fly in the face of Nigerian history where the opposition, at least portions of the opposition are regularly sort of brought into the ruling party coalition and, and bought off. But um, I think it could still show some interesting uh, possibilities of opposition there. And as Richard said also, I think there's a big question for Peter Obi and his movement on the ground is whether they can transform into something that's more than simply a Southern Nigerian movement into something that is actually a real viable opposition that is looking at 2027 and is building something on the ground and is continuing to push on, on the ground for, for changes. Um, I want to sort of end the comments with just, you know, quickly on the, the, you know, sort of maybe some of the more optimistic scenarios. And you're gonna laugh when I say this, but I'm actually very optimistic that the, 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 the most prominent uh, sort of rigging strategy we saw on the ground this time was vote buying. Um, and why am I optimistic about that is that the combination of the, the technology in INEC that beginning with Professor Jega and, and that has continued has shifted the focus of corruption activities on the Nigerian voter, which means that more than, than, than ever in the past, it's the Nigerian voter that has mattered so much in this election. And although I think there are certainly all sorts of signs of traditional rigging strategies of changing numbers throughout the coalition process, I think predominantly we've seen the main political parties trying to influence voters on the ground. And I'm a firm believer that public policy is nothing more than uh, larger scale vote buying. In, in <laughs> essence, that is what we want from our elected rulers is that there's this critical shift from actually handing money to voters at the election to saying, you know, that's too expensive for me as a candidate. I'm just going to give you a school. I'm going to give you roads. And that's what public policy is. And, you know, uh, uh, coming from, I was born in Chicago and I live in Boston. I'm, I'm, I'm very open to, to rigging strategies. And I, I think it took 150 years for us to change in the United States. I'm optimistic that, that, uh, that Nigerians and Africans will be moving much more quickly. Uh, the question is, is how long will that take? At what point will that sort of shift go from, from this sort of the, the vote buying structure? And I don't mean to suggest this is an inexorable process, but it's a, it's a, it's a shift up from where we were in 2000, 2007, like you're saying, where more and more the voter matters, the institution is getting stronger, and it produced an election that, that many people are unhappy with. But I, I think that the system itself is, is certainly stronger. And, and just to end on, on where Richard, underscoring what Richard said as well, I think the big question now is whether if, if the Tanubu government survives, as I think it will, uh, a, the court challenges, can it provide a, a shift in, in sort of the, the overwhelming security issues in, in the next three to six months? Because I think what, what this election has robbed Tanubu of is any kind of a honeymoon. I think he's going to have to very quickly put a team in place and he's going to have to address these bread and butter security and, and, and economic issues as quickly as possible. Or we're going to see, and I think first, as you're saying, we're going to see deterioration in the southeast, which feels like it's had its election mandate cheated. Uh, and uh, we've already seen in the northwest, um, the, the kidnapping banditry bands have already uh, you know, uh, re resumed their activities. They took a break during the elections uh, because the politicians needed things to be clear. Um, and, uh, you know, in the Northeast, of course, Boko Haram and other places. So I'll stop there. And, and Richard, thank you for, for um, inviting me to make a few comments. Wow. Um, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to follow up on some, something that you've raised about the technical aspects of the election. Um, in many elections, there's something called parallel vote tabulation, a uh, system based on uh, demographics that tries to uh, ascertain whether or not the vote count comes very close to what one would predict based on certain kinds of measures. And sometimes that can be extremely accurate, it can come within 25% or even less. Um, 
And I wonder, was there a parallel vote tabulation this time? Did you think that the votes really were counted? So my understanding is that Yaga did a parallel vote count again, which is an NGO, you know, in uh, and they were supported, I think, by NBI in the in the effort. And the last that I saw was that they were showing some wide variation in a number of states, particularly River State, for instance, which is very clearly, you know, sort of old style, you know, rigging processes all, all across. Mm -hmm. But that in, in other parts of the Federation, they were showing, I think, anywhere from five to seven percent variation. Um, which is considerable for PPT. Which is considerable. So, but I think it broke down from state to state. And, and Lagos, for instance, I think was, was in that sort of importantly varied range. I think the Southeast was having problems. Parts of the North, interestingly, were not showing mm -hmm. big variation. But the, the problem with the PDT, of course, is it, it doesn't catch vote buying strategies no. at, at all. It, what it catches is, is, is funny business in the coalition process. And so, um, but I, I'd be curious if others, you know, have, have harder numbers on what Yaga might have said on that point. That was my, my memory, but I haven't seen it in the last two weeks. Super, thank you. Who else would like to ask a question? Yeah. So, Richard, your, your earlier work on Nigeria focused a lot on corruption. Yeah. And I'm curious if you can talk about the ways in which you um, think corruption has evolved in Nigeria. Um, so, you know, your, your work on free mental politics was very influential in thinking about about how offices were used to enrich people. It strikes me that it's a different situation in Nigeria in some ways because you do have this class of, of, of wealthy people outside of the state, but still, who still have ties. So I'm curious if you can kind of reflect on 30 years later, uh, you know, how have, how have things shifted in, in Nigeria? All right, so for people who are listening online, I mean, we, you know, we have set aside uh, one of these sessions here to talk about, you know, Peter Eke's two publics and the, um, you know, the uh, contemporary state. And so I've had to go back and look at some of those issues. So let me give you a very, very short answer to it. Uh, and this is that the people who have been at the top of the columns uh, with regard to these elections are people who have really managed this duality in Nigeria, the duality of a very prebendalized uh, uh, state system. I have not really seen any fundamental change in that regard. Uh, you know, together with uh, the, you know, the acquisition of substantial well, uh, and these things have grown in parallel in Nigeria. Right? The two things I, I see them growing in parallel. I'm not going to call out any names here in terms of it. And uh, you know, as I mentioned, one of my colleagues, one of the most moving, uh, really testimonies I received over the election was from that colleague B, who was just talking about Obi. Um, and how Obi seemed to represent uh, an alternative uh, to this very prebendalized, quote unquote, corrupt. But of course, Obi is a person who came up <laughs> through the system as a state governor and who also was a candidate for the PDP. So, uh, you know, he obviously knows how to straddle both worlds. So, let me just stop there. I want to give us an opportunity for some of the other people that, you know, who are waited online. But to be continued. <laughs> I'm still waiting for someone to tell us what prebendal actually means. But... Oh, it's, it's on there. You could, that, it's a good Wikipedia description. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else in the room? I know there's some hands raised already um, in Zoom land, including, uh, is it Professor Levin? Yes. Yeah, why don't you call on him if you want to. Okay. Yeah. Shall we? Levan. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Carl Levan from American University. Carl, um, you're can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'm Carl Levan from American University. Thanks for including me in this dialogue, Richard. And uh, thanks for inspiring my dissertation with your uh, excellent book and some of the work that I've done afterwards. 
Um, in, I wanted to react to and maybe elaborate on some of the comments that we've heard so far. Um, and I think, you know, one set of uh, reactions has to do with uh, just the organization of the elections and how we think about election organization legally, administratively, and sociologically, sort of what uh, the elections mean to uh, democratization as a process of acquiring values in Nigeria. Um, I think administratively, one of the things that really struck me was that the BIVAS failed in almost a quarter of the polling units that uh, observers were deployed to um, by the Center for Democracy and Development. They sent out 5,000 observers and, a quarter, and nearly a quarter of the polling units, the BIVAS just didn't work first time around. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean voters were disenfranchised. Um, and, and there's strong evidence that they were actually able to vote, you know, through the contingencies. But it does mean that, uh, you know, placing expectations and unreasonable expectations, as you noted earlier, um, can really set up, uh, you know, a hot situation. And in some parts of the country, northeast and northwest, it was much higher than that, even the rate of failure. What's also interesting, though, is that uh, you know observers, including CDD, reported that uh, those issues were overwhelmingly fixed quite quickly, which is interesting and encouraging. Um, and you know, I think it is you know an interesting point of conversation to say that a lot of the vote buying, a lot of the uh, challenges facing elections have shifted to individual voters, and that's actually what the vote buying means. But um, you know, I do worry that vote buying has gone up. Um, you know, Yaga uh, that's been mentioned estimates about six percent of voting, six percent of the polling units that they were um, uh, stationed at, their observers observed uh, vote buying, and um, the CDD observers saw it at eleven percent of their um, uh, polling units that they were um, looking at. So, you know, on the one hand. Um, you know, there is this adjustment of, you know, learning democracy um, and an expectation that your vote should matter. And so therefore, maybe your vote is a commodity for sale. But I think, um, you know, Nigeria is also very similar to other African countries surveyed by the Afrobarometer and that people's expectations for democracy are overwhelmingly not being met, that there's this demand and this unmet demand. And so I think that's one of the reasons why protests have erupted and persisted that, um, you know, for whatever we want to say about the voting process uh, in terms of the uh, voter, you know, the BBAS and the hardware and sort of the technologies and the legal framework, that there is sort of some broader phenomena that people feel like their voices are not being heard um, by uh, the, you know, existing opportunities they have to do so. Um, and I wanted to make, you know, perhaps a technical point about the PVTs, um, you know, since that came up as well. So the PVTs uh, did, in fact, show some uh, deviation from River State and Emo State, and um, and interestingly, uh, you know, you know, the, the, the those margins were not negligible, uh, you know, as pointed out that they were, you know, fairly large margins. I'm sorry. Uh, no, just for for viewers, you know, the PVT is the parallel vote tabulation, and Emo State is in the southeast, and River State is further to the east. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, thank you, and and I'll I'll try to be brief, make one or two other points. Um, the the problem, and this is a technical problem, I think, is that um, the parallel vote count is statistically sampled to be nationally representative, not to be representative at the state level. And so um, there is something to say with a deviation in the, in the parallel vote tabulation for a particular state, but um, it wasn't, the sample size was not large enough really to draw conclusions without, within a reasonable margin of error for any particular state. And I think that this is, um, you know, perhaps a flaw in how the donor community has approached the best way to support election observation and some of these technical opportunities is that 
if we're going to do PVTs and if elections are going to turn on not an overall national result, but results in particular states, it just needs to be bigger. It needs to be a larger sample size. And so I think, you know, that's that's going to be um, you know, problem. I think the other really interesting thing that has been underemphasized, um, I think, about the mechanics of the election is that we have, you know, three major candidates, each of whom won 12 states. 36 states, three candidates, three major candidates, and each of those candidates won 12 states. So the good news is that I think that made Nigeria's electoral map a little bit messy and complicated and interesting. And I think this is good for the way uh, social differences and uh, social cleavages interact with political mobilization. But, um, you know, I think in the political imagination in the average Nigerian citizen, I think they're looking at that map and thinking, how did one person end up the winner? Um, and the obvious answer is that the opposition was split. But, um, you know, I, I think there, there are, there are going to be some nuances that um, the National Assembly and the president and that uh, politicians in general are going to have to muddle through, as you say, I think, in the next couple of years. Okay, thank you very much. Um, could we go also to uh, Amaka Anku, who is online? Um, and if you would make sure you're unmuted. Let's see if you hear Hi, you. can you guys hear me? Hi, everybody. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, so, yeah, I'll try to keep my comments short. I think a, a couple things that I just wanted to clarify for the conversation. Um, I think it's important for the, the, the technology that the um, Electoral Commission used, and I've noticed this in the commentary, there's a lot of confusion between um, what we're calling the BVAS, which was meant to do one thing. So the, the iPad system was focused more on reducing vote pattern. Okay, so that's the, the BVAS was about vote pattern because it was about biometrically verifying all voters before they could vote. And one of the biggest ways for um, electoral vote manipulation in Nigeria was vote pattern, right? So you, you could have, if you look at the numbers, um, the numbers are lower in all regions because not as many people as they said were coming out to vote were actually coming out to vote, right? So you could just say, you know, 100 more people came out to vote, but it was harder to do that this time because the BVAS, you could not vote unless you were biometrically verified, okay? So that was, I think, in my view, one of the things that has been lost in the conversation about the failure, the second part of the technology was uploading results from over 180,000 polling units onto a viewing portal so that the public could see it, okay? So the biometric voter verification worked and it worked in reducing vote pattern, right? Like that, it worked because across the board, you could not have more votes than were biometrically accredited. Okay, and that was a part of why we saw low numbers across the board from places where we normally would see high numbers. That worked. The part that didn't work, and I, and I think that in my view, that created one of the most, I would say, um, transparent elections Nigeria has had, because you actually had clear, a clear uh, way to verify how many people came out to vote. Right. In most, and, and I think Carl was saying that there were maybe a quarter of places where it didn't work initially and then there had to be replacements. But for the most part, um, that part worked. Now, the part that didn't work was the part where you were supposed to have um, this uploading of polling results onto a, a, a website that would be publicly accessible. Now, I think where the conversation, I think, I think where there were, in my view, misplaced expectations on what that process was meant to deliver. And I wrote about this before in 2021, that it would, it could, it would, could be easily um, sort of manipulated for partisan ends. And this is what I meant. So there's somehow the public was led to believe, and I think it was in part, there were in part, a failure from the Electoral Commission and also 
partisan um, leverage or, or manipulation. The public was led to believe that this, the uploading of results after the election would somehow prevent vote manipulation. I don't believe that's actually a, a, the right way to look at it. Because if you're going to manipulate the votes, you're going to manipulate it and then just post manipulated results on the website, right? And that is what we saw in River State. So in River State, you actually had that. You had a lot of manipulated uh, sheets that were posted, on, uh, uploaded. Um, because there are over 180,000 polling units, there's no way to actually, like, for people sitting at home, to very quickly add up the results before the legal process, which is that in every polling unit, there were two polling officers, there were agents, party agents that were supposed to sign off on each polling unit results. And so all, each political party would have a copy individually, regardless of what's posted online. Um, anyway, so, so the, the point is, I think that there were expectations, there were maybe too high or unrealistic ex expectations that were placed on what that, that uploading of the PDF would actually um, uh, achieve. And some people even believe that it was electronic collation rather than just an uploading of a picture of what the parties already had. So I think that that was a failure, in my view, that was a significant failure in communication and in uh, in managing expectations of the voting public that, that ended up undermining the credibility of the results, right? And, and I think that's one of the things that if I were to advise an INEC that they should work on really clarifying for the next election. Um, so a couple of things, and then it, it, just a couple more points I wanted to make about uh, points that have been made about perceptions of, of democracy. So my view, and I've looked at this data and I've written about it, my view is that you know the the greatest threat people often say the the reason that Nigerians are not satisfied in the way democracy works, which is what the um, Afrobarometer has been asking, is not because of processes in my view right and if and if you ask them if you actually look at what they people don't want it's not it's not necessarily about they're, they're not asking for more process they're asking for deliver, better delivery of public services. They're asking for water, they're asking for electricity, they're asking for roads, they're asking for government to work, they're asking for administrative capacity, right? And, and those things have not gotten better. And so I think that's the key thing for me, the key thing for me watching, looking ahead is, can this new government deliver on critical public services that Nigerians have been asking for? Better electricity, better road, jobs, right? Um, and those are the things that, in my view, that's the biggest threat to the overall perception of will democracy work for me, is will the state actually work for me in, and in delivering my, the things that I, I think is important. So I'll just, I'll just stop there. Well, thank you very much. Now, I'm going to pipe up and just note that we've heard references to people in, in Nigeria being dissatisfied with their democracy. The Afrobarometer uh, poll that... Um, Mark Anku just referred to said that 77% of Nigerians were dissatisfied with their democracy. It's a shocking number. In the United States, it's just 71%. <laughs> yeah, can, can I also just make one comment here? Um, and, you know, a lot of the conversation so far has taken place around the issues of INEC and the procedures and, you know, and you know, all of the rest, the technology, and, and, you know, that's extremely important. But I think also I'm hoping that, you know, some of the commentators would also take up this idea, this issue of just the fundamental distrust within Nigeria, the polarization that has very quickly emerged following, you know, these elections, the contest. So on the one hand, you've got this contentious election, just in terms of the, you know, the processes and so on, allegations. But you also have a country that has been stumbling in terms of its own sense of nationhood. 
right? And once these problems have come up, all of a sudden you get this incredible polarization taking place. So I hope that you know any of the people online who could actually kind of speak to that, because I'm I'm really concerned about that Nigeria can actually go through focusing a lot on these elections while the country itself is really pulling apart. And even among elites, I'm telling you, you know, some of the, the, the language and commentaries uh, are very worrying. It's very, you know, the, the level of vituperation is very high. And some of it is really, you know, hate speech. Okay. I mean, let's be frank about some of what is going on in, you know, in Nigeria. Also resonates with your last comment. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind if I go on online again for someone who's had their yeah. hand up for a while? Mm. It's, um, forgive me if I pronounce this incorrectly, Ula Jamoke Jakob Haliso, is that correct? Yes, um, can you hear me? Yeah, dear. Thank you so much. Um, you did pronounce it remarkably okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Remarkably okay. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're forgiven. Um, it's just a pleasure to 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 hear Professor um, Joseph and all the incredible um, analysis this afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to to this occasion, um, Professor Richard Joseph. I refer to him as um, as a grandfather <laughs> professor because he taught my teachers at Ibadan, <laughs> and um, I wish I were there in person. Um, I just two minutes ago got back in from a conference in Texas and um, just needed to say something. I logged in from the airport. Um, I think I would continue from where Amaka uncle stopped and maybe just, again, emphasize one or two things she said. Um, um, just by way of introduction, I'm Olaji Mokeya Kob Haliso. I teach at Brandeis University, right um, down the road from you at Boston there. Um, and I have done some empirical work on elections since at least um, 2011. Um, 2011 sponsored directly by INEC to collect data about um, events on the ground. Um, in 2015, I was part of um, a small group of elections experts uh, put together under the leadership of Professor Adele Ginodu and Professor Jibrin Ibrahim of CDD, sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation, to systematically study key issues in Nigeria's elections, some of which, and which included members of the um, um, INEC, in order for that scholarly analysis to feed directly into the process. And some of that has done so as in the continuous implementation of technology, as in the amendments to the electoral law, these were issues that that, that group um, brainstormed about, conducted empirical research about, and made recommendations to governments um, about. So I, I speak with um, just a little bit of a sense of, um, shall I say, um, um, and this has been infuriating to my fellow Nigerians, just the fact that I am not surprised about many of the dynamics um, surrounding these elections, because when we look at Nigerian elections, historically, up until 2019, and I'm talking of even these recent elections from 1999 to recently, um, I do not think that all the um, stories coming out of the 2023 elections are surprising for people like Professor Carl Levan, Professor Darren Q, and others who do um, study Nigerian elections. Um, and um, so that's the first thing I want to say. Now, from a sense of history, um, these elections are not very different from previous Nigerian elections. So just to put um, in my mind, um, just to, to, to put that on the table. Second is the, problem of expectations. And expectations them, by themselves were, um, they are two pronged. And I'm glad that Amaka Anko began to speak about that. Expectations about the process of elections and then expectations about the outcome in terms of how government delivers 
democracy, um, um, proced institutionally, procedurally, and in terms of values, and what Nigerians refer to as good governance, right, or the dividends of democracy, um, whatever that may mean, right? And I think the problem with this election is the disconnect between the expectations of institutional performance and the delivery um, on the election day, right? Mm -hmm. But in terms of consistency with the historical record, there's nothing that happened in these last elections that have not happened before. Um, um, in after the 2015 elections, I led a study of the deployment of the smart card readers, which was INEX first, um, shall I say progressive attempt, not the first, to use technology to address some of the naughty issues in Nigerian elections. And um, the lessons from the deployment of the smart card readers were simply that they remained, while technology has its advantages, they remained entirely susceptible to the manipulation of the key players in the elections, that is political parties and their agents, mostly, as well as um, whoever they can corrupt in the process. So I expected exactly the same thing to happen at these elections with the Beavers and the IREV. In fact, these elections, have been more successful in the use of technology to arrest the historical um, problems with Nigeria's elections. Again, I have to thank Amaka Anko for distilling very clearly the advantages that and the stock test of the beavers in these elections, because it dealt with one major issue that the smart card readers were supposed to deal with and failed in dealing with, which is just people voting who are not supposed to vote. The beavers, 80% of the time, more than 80% in many places, in some places as high as 92%, worked effectively in managing that. So, so the, the other part of the process, which is the IREF portal, I think again, came down to the expectations. And um, that necessarily links um, this, question of expectations with the role of social media, right? And I think that's one key factor in this election that we must always include in the analysis. Without social media, the expectations about the IREP portal that Amaka has explained would not have been as amplified, as widespread and as distorted as they were. And we must um, um, acknowledge that. Um, I think anyone who looked at um, not just the history, but what the IRA was supposed to exactly do would have known that there were, there were likely to be um, issues with the delivery. And of course, INEC needs to take responsibility for also amping up those expectations um, as we, we are very much aware of. Um, I think the last thing I would speak to, and there are just so many things, um, is precisely the last point that Professor Joseph just made which I think is one of the most important things to talk about in this election. Everything is important, but important because now the elections are partly behind us, what next? And that's a question of how these elections have unearthed, unearthed as well as amplified and possibly irrevocably deepened the historical cleavages of ethnicity, religion and region in Nigeria. And how I suspect that the divisions that, are, that have been um, 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 deepened by the way these elections have proceeded um, will become problematic in ways that are new perhaps in the coming years. And again, um, I think the posture of the incoming government on these divisions could go a long way towards attenuating the possible negative fallouts of the um, horrible ethnicization, horrible um, religious um, um, hatred, really, that has emanated uh, from these elections. Just a few days ago, um, the audio of a conversation between Peter Obi and the head of one of Nigeria's biggest mega churches um, went viral, right? Um, and both Obi and the, the pastor have not denied the fact that they had a conversation um, about basically 
Christian jihad. That's just putting it bluntly as elections being a way of fighting a war um, against the other religion they perceive as oppositional. And so we have descended to such a level in Nigeria that um, um, I think it would take the coming together of all the key political actors um, to walk back from yet another precipice. Nigeria tends to teeter on the edge of several precipices. Uh, but I think this time around, um, there are implications not just for, the, um, for government and governance, there are also implications even for the key political actors themselves. Many political observers have rightly noted that um, uh, Peter Obi, who garnered so much youth support and um, support from the South mainly, um, is unlikely to ever be able to summon or um, generate that amount of support again in subsequent elections because even Nigerians who thought that Peter Obi was here to unify the country um, and um, uh, put an end to corruption, I mean, just govern better, seeing the signs of um, a certain ethnic, religious, and whatever bent are uh, beginning to, um, to rethink and re reimagine a country without any leader that has these kinds of um, of biases. And so I anticipate a backlash against all these various cleavages in such a way that um, I think uh, um, the policy in Nigeria will remain heated for a while and will really um, struggle to find common ground. And as has been rightly pointed out, with a possibly divided House of Representatives coming up um, there may be a lot of challenges for the new government. But again, we know in Nigeria that the presidency is all powerful. The federal government is all powerful. It has the power of patronage. It has the power of, um, of basically um, using anti-democratic measures to do what it wants to do. So again, I, I, I find it difficult applying um, the principles of textbook democracy to the way government runs or elections run in Nigeria to explaining all these dynamics. Um, but all in all, what's happening here should also be linked with what's happening elsewhere. Kenya is having, has been having, and that's my last point. Other, Kenya other has been having repeated riots. Um, I call them riots or protests. I don't know, you know. Again, the opposition rejecting the last elections. So I think we need to also tie um, these cases together across board and try to see um, what exactly is going on beyond the mechanics of just how elections are run to basically how people are understanding what democracy in Africa should mean to them. And I think um, um, if we do that, perhaps we'll learn something new from this one. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, Tim, would you like to make sure. some comments? And then we'll um, go to Professor Subaru online after that. Okay. Well, quickly underscoring several of those themes, especially the last one <clears throat> that Professor Thomas emphasized, basically the collapse of civil discourse. Um, this is partially with the result of what we can see in Nigeria is also the result of what's happening here. Technology is intruding upon electoral processes, not so much in vote counting, but in terms of social media, as is underscored by our <clears throat> latest contribution, social media has changed the nature of the rising expectations people have of the electoral process. And it can't bear it. That is, the electoral process, no matter how sophisticated we get in counting the votes, cannot deliver to the expectations of those that have been stoked on social media. Um, Added to that is a crisis that's emerging in Nigeria on a scale that is truly biblical. Sea level is rising in Lagos at a pace that a previous government has ignored and has no plan to address. The key problem there is symbolic in one respect. Eco-Atlantic is something that the previous administration pitched at great uh, frequency, you might say, 
and <clears throat> with a great deal of um, expectation. And it's heightening the divide between the very rich and the very poor at a time when Lagos is inundated at high tide. That won't be reversed in an electoral cycle the next four years. In fact, it's an accelerating process of sea level rise, and eco Atlantic itself will be underwater by the end of the century. Very good, thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm very eager to hear from Professor Subaru, as you could well imagine. Okay, <laughs> so, Professor Subaru, are you there? Yes, are thank you. you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Joseph, for your insightful comments and uh, to all uh, the others who have spoken. Um, I find it difficult to be bullish about Nigeria, you know, unlike Ken or Palo. Uh, and, you know, I wasn't in Nigeria for the elections. I was in Nigeria in, uh, in January and early February. Uh, but from what I've read so far and what I've heard, I am, you know, terribly torn between optimism and pessimism. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the grounds for optimism, uh, when you look at the, uh, you know, the president-elect, you know, uh, the presumed uh, president-elect, uh, we note that he's been actually at the forefront uh, of the struggle for democracy in Nigeria. He was very active in the June 12 struggle against a military rule. Uh, he is a civilian. Uh, in the past, uh, how many years of civilian rule in Nigeria? Uh, we've had 16 years under military leaders who basically became, uh, you know, civilians. You know, you had Obasanjo eight years and Buhari uh, another eight years in power. Uh, he, uh, Tinubu will be a civilian, you know, a conventional civilian uh, with the expectation uh, that he's more pro-democratic than, you know, the military officers, you know, who are basically turned into uh, a Democrat, so to say. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, the other ground for optimism is that the president-elect has actually been in the forefront, again, of this quest for true federalism in Nigeria. As Professor Richard Joseph and others know, uh, a major issue in Nigeria has been this, you know, the quest for constitutional reform. The perception uh, that the current constitution is ill-suited uh, to Nigeria's needs, that it is too centralized. And Tinubu has been more or less, for me, the chief apostle of this idea of uh, regenerating and reviving uh, Nigerian federalism. Uh, the final ground for optimism, you know, is, is also the fact that this current election represents the institutionalization of power rotation in the Nigerian context. You know, you've had a power shift between the north and the south of the country. Uh, and the fact that this has also just been institutionalized in this current election seems to be a ground for optimism. You know, we don't find this level of a power rotation, power sharing in many other African countries that are ethnically divided. Now, in terms of you know, the grounds for uh, pessimism, uh, we've been talking a lot about prebendalism and the simple definition is that, you know, it's the systematic use of public resources to benefit oneself and more importantly, one support group. And I would say, our president-elect, unfortunately, is a quintessential prebendalist, in my view, uh, is reputed or notorious for, you know, the way he's governed Lagos and the way in which he controls part of the resources uh, of the state. At the elections, you know, second ground for pessimism is that the elections actually represent a setback. Under Professor Jega, there we are real reforms and there was some credibility to the electoral process. Many Nigerians agree uh, that this current election have basically uh, you know, dashed expectations about uh, progressive electoral reforms in Nigeria. This has been a kind of a regression. Um, 
The other is, you know, I think Darren mentioned the court process. Now there has been, a, you know, there has been a lot of uh, concern about the credibility of the judiciary in Nigeria. And I agree with Darren that it is unlikely uh, that the court will overturn this election, but that is going to reinforce the perception that the judicial process in Nigeria is compromised and tainted. And there are already rumors about how uh, you know, the judiciary is going to be complicit in the legitimization of electoral for, uh, fraud. Uh, the final point I want to make, and I think Professor Joseph uh, spoke about it and Jumotke, uh, uh, Professor Alice also talked about uh, this, you know, it's just the inflammatory rhetoric, the inflammatory rhetoric post-election. For me, sadly, on the part of the ruling party, you know, uh, the stigmatization of the Igbo ethnic group. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that has really been unfortunate. And I see a sense of, in spite of the fact that the elections were controversial and that the legitimacy of the government is uh, are dubious, I see a kind of triumphalist winner takes all mentality uh, on the part of this, of at least not the president elect, but some of his spokespersons. Whereas what we need uh, is an inclusive government, especially a government that tries to include the Southeast, uh, which for very good reasons feels alienated and marginalized by this process. So uh, because of those reasons, um, yeah, you know, I'm really just torn between uh, you know, those grounds for optimism and those, you know, the grounds for pessimism. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, we are nearing the end of our time. I think there's one more question online, but I want to leave enough time for Professor Joseph to sum up if he would like to. Um, well, who's the person, maybe? Who are you waiting? So it's uh, Samuel uh, Olorontoa. Yeah, please let him on. Yeah, please. Okay. He's, he is. Yeah. He'll, he'll identify himself in terms of his scenarios. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be very brief. And thanks to Professor Joseph for organizing this. Uh, like Professor Halito said, he's a grandfather of Nigerian politics and democracy. Um, we had great expectations uh, for that election. I'm from the Institute of African Studies, Carleton University um, in Canada. We had great expectations for the election that it will lead to a kind of a change in the political order. And there were expectations that the use of technology will promote that. But what we miss is the sociological factor. That is to say that the elite weaponized poverty to ensure patronage. And that's what played out. Somebody's mentioned that maybe because Afrobarometer studies, uh, maybe the question is not the issue of poverty, but I think poverty play a lot because vote buying, which we have seen in previous elections, was still a significant factor. That even though there's beavers, the, 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 the prospect of transferring election without the human factor, like Abi Bonadilaku wrote uh, last week Thursday in the punch column, is, is, is not, is, 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 is far fetched. It's possible to have all the technology without addressing the sociological factor that make people vulnerable to being bought over by the political elite, um, you know, undermine the possibility. Of, of, of getting those um, technology to work effectively uh, in the interest of, of the people. And to what you say that the issue of ethnicity that people are talking about is very unfortunate, but I would think that it's also a, 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 the elite that weaponize ethnicity, you know, to ensure that they retain, to maintain the order. Of course, we know in political theory that it's not easy to change and establish an entrenched political order but we see that we see that the elite weaponize uh, ethnicity because the OB movement, the OB movement, had this head shaking possibility of bringing about a new order in Nigeria. Uh, but of course, the triumphalism that uh, Professor Subiru mentioned uh, is a, is a factor that even though OB won in Lagos on on February twenty five, the whole thing changed within uh, within two weeks because of reactions and counter reactions. So that I think is a deliberate ploy by the elite to ensure that the, the status quo remains. And if we want a new Nigeria, 
there will be that need for deliberate rethinking of our thinking to ensure that we, the, the people who are affected by malgovernance, by misgovernance, they, they see beyond this narrow uh, consideration of ethnicity and religion. But lastly, on the, on the note of optimism, I will see the election as, as a kind of Nigeria ride, ride, riding against the wind of democratic backsliding in West Africa, at least. We've seen a lot of coup and coup d'etat, but we see that at least, even though democracy has not been consolidated as it were, it's like everybody don't believe that democracy can provide a means for change. So I think what we should be thinking about is to ensure there's credibility in the process. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank you. much. We are just about out of time. All right, so well, I just like need to... one minute. Yes, thank you very much. I'm so glad. Thank you for my colleagues, uh, you know, who heeded the call and to, to share their opinion. I am, uh, I am concluding in a very hopeful mood. Um, and it's because I think what has taken place today is what I think we can actually go and continue to nurture in order to recreate these spaces where we can have this kind of, you know, of discourse, you know, the scholarly discourse, you know, the reflective discourse, the bringing in some of the expectations from the fact. And in that way, not only to advance and improve what we're doing among ourselves, but how we can actually influence, you know, what is going to be happening in this very important country, you know, over the coming months. So I, I, I'm, I'm feeling, uh, you know, not only do I have my grandchildren, in, uh, in scholarly terms, and I have my real actual, one of my real actual, uh, you know, grandchildren. Thank you all. I'm so, I'm, in a, I'm really in a good place. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> Professor Joseph, thank you so much for, for your comments here today, but also for bringing together this intellectual community here uh, for us all to benefit from. Uh, it's exactly the kind of thing that we want uh, these seminars to be, a real intellectual discussion and a real exchange of views. So thank you so much for provoking that. Yeah. Um,